Morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody here today. If you're a first time visitor to GVCF, we want to especially welcome you. And uh, we'd like to do that with a round of applause, which may seem quite odd, but it's our way of appreciating you. So well done coming along to GVCF. For everybody else, it's also good to see you back. And we've had some visitors coming back again from uh, further afield. And then, of course, some of our own GVCF folk uh, back in town. So welcome to everybody. Uh, And it is August, as my lovely wife has said, around about that time of year, if you enter your AFL, where Collingwood starts losing. So it is um, that time of year, and Essendon as well, so some things never change, uh, but the good teams are starting to heat up. So we'll see how we go this year. Nervous. But I'll tell you one thing that's not bringing too many nerves is the goodness of God and how good He is. We've got this series called Deconstructing. And I won't go through it again because uh, last week I introduced it at length and it took about 15 minutes to introduce a four-week series. So uh, if you weren't here last week or you... and Sorry, we welcome everybody online as well as you join us for this part of the service. Um, if you didn't get a chance to catch last week, I'd encourage you to do that on that YouTube channel that my lovely wife mentioned, GVCF Church, is what you'll be looking for there, the forward slash GVCF Church. And uh, that introduction of what we're talking about is there. So I'd encourage you to listen to that, if not the rest of what we spoke about last week. We're going to head in a different direction this week. It's called Bodyguard God. Deconstructing faith or deconstructing God. A lot of people are doing that at the moment right across the world. They're putting it out there on social media. And part of the deconstruction for some, the difficulty they're running into, is that they're seeing God as a bodyguard God. Now... I was going to actually don my shades because, uh, you know, shades is a 70s word for sunglasses in case you're under the age of 30. There we go. And you've seen these guys uh, that, and they stand near Joe Biden and, I don't know, Tom Cruise and famous people and, and they're just standing there in the background standing like this. Have you seen these sort of guys? I've always wanted to be one of those people. They just look like really tough and really important, not weedy and wimpy like me. Maybe sunglasses m- make somebody look a lot tougher. So some of us have this theory that there's this bodyguard God and uh, it's kind of like we're the centre of his universe, just like Joe Biden or Tom Cruise or whoever this rich and famous person is that needs protecting. It's like God's just standing there with his sunglasses and he's just scouting the world. If anyone wants to mess with my kid, look out because you've got trouble coming to you. I'm not going to allow any trouble, any harm, any pain, any suffering come to my centre of the universe, Jeremy Rensford. So if you start to get anywhere near this boy, watch out because there'll be trouble. Now, of course, there's a potential difficulty with that, and I'll explain that in a moment. Put up your hand if you're over, or say 40 and over, please. If you're 40, you qualify. About half the room. All right, I'd ask you to stand if you're, if you're able. Oh, low blow. Good to see Graham still able to stand there as he ages significantly. See, some of you under 40, well done, Jarvis, you're just, yeah, yeah, just a, just a kid. So, so for some of us who are over 40, look at this wonderful group of over 40s. And I'm happy that there's enough people sitting that we're not just the over 40s church. Have a look around you under 40s, check them out. Good looking folk, sprightly, some have just had birthdays, some are in their, anyone in their 90s? Thank you. We have some in our 90s, just a couple. Yes, congratulations. And may you reach the triple figures, those in their 90s. Anyone in their 80s? Yeah, we've got a couple. Gets a bit harder, doesn't it, Baden? But you're still, still hanging around. Uh, it's good to see. Don't hurry up and leave us. 70s? Oh, look at that. Got some good numbers there. Thank you, the Hammonds. Big smiles on 70-plus faces. 60s, ah, the 60s, there we go, 50s, only a few of us hitting the prime of life, right, the 50s plus, everyone in his 50s that hit in the prime of life said, you can see it's really happening for them, and uh, (laughs) 40s, 40s, our babies, there they are, 40s, all right, now I want you to not yet sit down, but sit down if... You've never had significant hardship, 
pain and suffering. Sit down, if you, the ones that are standing up, if you've never had significant hardship at one stage of your life or pain or suffering, please sit down. If you've never had it. All right, now keep a look. Oh, and even then they just made a mistake because I didn't term, I didn't make the question clear enough, which is a problem when you're a public speaker. Make things clear, Jeremy. That was public speaking 101. I forgot. Okay, so have a look, young people, at the percentage of people that have sat down that have never had significant pain and suffering. In other words, have had a bodyguard God to keep every little bit of ill and harm away from them. Have a look at how many people have experienced that God. Not, I don't think there was one. And there could be one, because there are always outliers. But all of us... Outlier? Oh... <laughs> All of us over 40 have had significant pain and suffering. For some, it's been the death of a child. For others, it's been a divorce. For others, it's been perhaps trauma in a, in a uh, refugee situation. And, and everybody has their own story at GVCF of pain and suffering. Now, guess what? I didn't ring 70 people to say, I've got this illustration, make sure you keep standing up. I didn't have time. But when I prepared for this talk... I knew this would be the response. You may be seated. So if we believe in a bodyguard God, that a lot of people, as they deconstruct, have got this issue with God not protecting me, not keeping harm from me. I'm struggling with whatever. Keep in mind that everybody struggles with whatever. And God has not held up his part of the agreement if the agreement was in fact to keep harm from us and only allow good things to come our way nobody likes pain and suffering but the reality is in all likelihood it was unavoidable or it's going to be unavoidable depending on your age and of course we shall not put the under 40s down some of them haven't yet had that experience but a lot of them have and I'll get to in a moment, there needs to be compassion in the room for whoever is suffering from pain and suffering, whether it's a child, whether it's a young adult, whether it's an oldie or anyone in between. May we have compassion in the room because that's the heart of Christ. But I will get to that in a moment. So sure enough, trouble is coming. So I want to unpack this notion of bodyguard God. And then I've, I went into some logistics of if that God existed, what is he like? So we're going to do some reverse theology in that we're going to the theologize a fake God in a moment. And that's going to be a bit of fun. Because if there is this such thing as a bodyguard God, what is he like and what is his character? And I'm going to look at that God, even though he, I'm going to propose to you he doesn't exist. So um, if you turn to Psalm 91, verse 3 to 7 and 9 and 10, you'll see that on the screen. And by the way, um, at GVCF, we've just had uh, a little bit of silence in recent times, in recent years. If you listen right now, you've only got three or four Bibles changing and a lot of you aren't on your mobiles. Now, this is not a guilt trip, but I'd, slow, I'd strongly encourage you, bring a Bible we have the scriptures there. We don't actually write them out because we want people to be navigating their Bible so important as part of a faith journey. Now, most of us here, or if not all of us, are on a faith journey. Uh, a lot of us here believe in Jesus and follow Jesus. Not everybody. And it's the joy of my life that not everybody at GVCF follows Jesus because, you know, we don't just want to be this group that stays, uh, you know, that, that doesn't grow. We want people that are not yet following Jesus coming along and learning what, what following him is all about. Uh, and so if you are one of those people, understand this is how we roll. This is our, our book. This is what we believe is true. And that's why I plead with you. Bring it along with you. Again, no guilt trip, not looking at anybody. I wouldn't have a clue who doesn't bring it. But let's get back into the habit of bringing a Bible to church or a mobile phone with an app where you can follow the scriptures. I think personally my preference is this, for me personally, because it just means I can get used to finding where like Malachi is and Hosea and all these ones where I'm not quite sure where they are. And whereas if it's just on the app, it's just there and you click on it. So for me, that's better. But for you, if it's an app, go for it. But just a little side point, please bring your Bibles along to GVCF. It's a good habit 
to get into. So we're unpacking this bodyguard God. If he exists, what is he like? And some people are using scripture to discover this God and to set an expectation of what this God looks like. And I'm not here to poo-poo scripture. These are beautiful, beautiful scriptures, but we can take them out of context. So we've got Psalm 91, verse 3. uh, You can see it on your screen, starting in verse 3. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand but it will not come near you. Verse 9 and 10. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. Now, there's some beautiful scriptures there, uh, beautiful promises there in scripture. And I want to encourage people, and I'll do it throughout this sermon. If you're holding on to scripture for healing, hold on to that scripture. If you're holding on to Scripture for breakthrough, hold on to that Scripture. If you're holding on to Scripture to get rid of your demons of the past, hold on to that Scripture. If you're holding on to Scripture for your business that's struggling and it needs to get back up, hold on to that Scripture. But if you're going to hold on to that Scripture, which I warmly encourage you to do, understand it needs to be in a wider context and not just grabbing a verse and holding to it and believing for it. And then if we only do that, Without the wider context of these verses, we can find ourselves in danger. Because even just that last verse I read, surely your enemies, uh, what, sorry, I'm 92, 91, the last one there says, no harm will befall you, no disaster will come to your tent. Now, we just saw with all the over 40s, they've had harm befall them and, and trouble come to their tent. Every single one. So if they all said, well, Psalm 91's a load of rubbish, God has not kept trouble from me, and therefore I'm checking out of Christianity. You see, that's not what this psalm is saying, but I don't want us to throw it out either. It's getting the right balance. And even last week, we talked about God being a balanced God between justice and between mercy, and he can do both simultaneously, miraculously, because we mere humans get it wrong all the time. And so it is with this one, we can believe for God's very best, but understand sometimes the very worst may come our way. And this tension and this conundrum that's called Christianity, we can navigate it in the context of being in a community that's courageous and walks alongside us in the conundrum. This is how this faith rolls when it is done at its very, very best. So if you just read these verses out of context, you could be forgiven for landing at a belief in a bodyguard God. But as I've just said, there's further context. And even in this chapter, before you go to any other part of the 66 other books and all the hundreds and thousands of chapters, check out verse 15. I didn't put that on the screen, sorry. But look at verse 15. And what does it say? I will be with him in trouble. See, that's why you have to bring your Bible. (laughs) Because every now and then I ask a question. I will be with him in trouble. So the psalmist writes these words of promise, these words that we cling to, these words that we can claim rightfully as Christians. But in the midst of that, later on in the chapter, he mentions that there will be trouble and God will be with us in trouble. So even just the context of this chapter, let alone the rest of Scripture, shows that trouble will come our way. And there's a big irony too in Psalm 91. If you want to talk about misquoting and you want to talk about taking out of context, do you know this is a psalm, some of the verses, that the only psalm or the only piece of Scripture that Satan quotes? Isn't that interesting? The only piece of Scripture that Satan quotes is from Psalm 91. And if you've ever listened to lots and lots of prosperity doctrine where they butcher scriptures like this, can you please stop? Because Satan wants to misquote this scripture, as does every extreme prosperity doctrine preacher. Let's call it out for what it is damaging and it lets people down. And people from the great continent of Africa that have been immersed in poverty, clinging clinging on to some vague, illogical promise from scripture, 
that has left them even worse than where they began. It makes me angry. It keeps people in poverty. It makes people disappointed in God, disappointed in man, and takes them further from God as they question their faith because they've been given the wrong God. God is a God in the trouble. God is God in the blessing. He's in both equally, and he's here for us to navigate whether we're in one or the other, a little bit of both. And thankfully, that's the God we follow. If you're having a hard time, let's go over the notes for a minute. You're having a hard time and you've sat under prosperity doctrine and you're sick. You know why you're sick? Because you're sick. (laughs) And if you think it's because you don't have enough faith, I'm here to tell you it's most likely not. It could be, but it's most likely not. If you're sick because you're sinning, I'm going to tell you God's going to let you, that's the, let you know that's the case. Because why would he punish us with sickness because we've mucked up and then just leave it vague so we don't even know why we're sick? If you're being sick because God's allowing it because you're in rebellion, sure as anything he's going to let you know, son, this is part of my judgment. Get, get righteous, get quick. This is the God we serve. So if you're sick, it's because you're sick. If you're poor, it's because it's a season and God's got more principles to teach you. God wants to build your faith and God wants to bring you to a place where you can be godly comfortable. If you're not rich, God may never want you to be rich by Australian standards. I've just come back from Kenya where everybody in this room is rich. Seriously, everybody in this room is rich and I'm not putting down anyone who's struggling understand but by comparative terms everybody in this room is rich but if you want to be really rich by our standards God may not want that for you and that's okay some of the best people I've ever known are not rich they live humble lives and they don't care but they're rich in spirit and they can eat and they can have clothes and they can have shelter and they can send their kids to school and they're content I reckon they're pretty cool people By the way, I know very rich people that are just as happy because they're godly, they're blessed, they're generous, and I like those people too. I know most of us would like to be the second one, (laughs) but not all of us are called to be that. Sorry, off notes, get back onto notes. So when I got back from Africa, I preached with passion, Psalm 144 where I went through some of the promises for our brothers and sisters over there and what God had been revealing to us. You know, things like um, that their sons would be well-nurtured plants and that their daughters would be like pillars that adorn a palace. And we unpacked the blessing that has come in their way, where sheep would increase by thousands, even tens of thousands. Oxen would come and reduce the the burden and uh, and there would be so much prosperity and blessing and growth exponentially. And I preached that with sincerity of heart because you can ask Debbie you can ask my mother this is what's coming to our precious brothers and sisters in one little part of Africa that we go to that we spend time in fellowship with where there's so much potential for increased wealth and blessing that is unrealized and together as family we're working out how to realize that nothing wrong with that and nothing wrong with claiming those scriptures nothing wrong with believing that barns will be full when they don't even have barns yet because nothing's ever been full why build a barn if you don't have excess now we're going to build barns and we're going to see excess put in barns either metaphorically or actually so i preached that three weeks ago with passion with sincerity please understand that as i talk about this topic it only complements it doesn't contradict that message other scriptures that uh prosperity folk quote often out of context you can see them on the screen there i won't go through them but they are wonderful scriptures if taken within context jeff hammond spoke about the three tithes and we got malachi 3 there uh, where it talks about some of these things again a good sermon with context can help us understand giving and godly giving rather than just giving to get rich as many prosperity preachers would teach in error give so that you can get rich A self-centered gospel, not a God-centered gospel. Get to that in a moment. You can read those scriptures for yourself, but I've got to read one in King James because if you're going to be a really good heretical preacher, you've got to preach in King James. Nothing wrong with King James, by the way, but it just feels better if I preach this. 3, 3 John 1 verse 2. Beloved, I wish upon all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. 
Nothing wrong with King James, but it just has a better feel to it if you preach prosperity in that way. And so we cling on to that. And if I'm sick, somehow I'm evil. If I'm not rich, somehow I don't have enough faith. Nope. It's just called life, and every person over 40 has gone through it so far. You get the point. I'm laboring it now. I'll move on. A lot of this, understandably, just leads to disappointment when the inevitable pain comes. And it takes someone really, really, really full of faith to push past that and not get negative about it if they've been given the wrong foundational truths of the Scriptures. All right, let me, let me get on to this. Uh, there's a good quote here. Let, let me go there. Our sovereign protector's great power is shown not only in delivering us from danger, but also delivering us through danger. So you can please leave that on the screen for a little while because it's a lovely little quote that I found uh, while I was researching this topic. Our sovereign protector's great power is shown not only in delivering us from danger, that's just a bodyguard God, and he will do that at times or often, depending on faith and everything else, but at times it's also just as important that he delivers us through danger. It's a really good little quote there to help us get balance in what I'm saying. All right, so I'm going to have a little bit, little bit of fun here. If we claim the bodyguard God belief, if we believe in this mythical God that I've just explained, here's what we actually are saying about him. Listen to this. So come up with this. I hope it's good. Somehow God is indebted to us. He owes us one. Because the bodyguard God, if you're Joe Biden the ruler of the free world and any other famous person on this planet, the bodyguard is indebted to their master. So it's saying that we're the master. Somehow God is indebted to us, he owes us one. Number two, God exists to serve us. I am to be the centre of his universe, not vice versa. This is just logically, if we're going to run with this God that just keeps trouble from us, this is who he has to be in order to do that job well. Number three, not having any trouble or issues is ultimately the best thing for me. Not having any trouble or not having any issues is ultimately what's best for me. Number four, that God would need to set aside his wisdom on the matter of how much he should protect me, how much he should allow harm, in order to adopt my preferred way. So he needs to drop his wisdom in order to adopt my wisdom. And I'm going to be a bit controversial here, but that's typical. If you're a visitor of the church, that's sometimes how I roll. That God is a God of white privilege. Because Western mindset says that why does bad stuff happen to me? It's a very first world mindset. So that's a God of white privilege. The, the bodyguard God is a God of white privilege. Because, and it's not about colour, please understand. Look around this church, we're not... We're not fussed about colour. We love colour, <laughs> whatever colour it may be. So that's, that's who we are. But understand that when you go to colours of other countries, this is nowhere near an issue as what it is here. And so, again, you know, as somebody who's travelled, and I thank the Lord that I've been able to not only see as a tourist, but see as a, a guest, and then eventually, as you get to know people, see as family. This is not... Anywhere near a stronger notion amongst our family overseas as what it is here. So it's a white privilege, God. If that's wrong, then you can hit me up later, but that's what I'm seeing here. It, <clears throat> and ultimately, the implication is that we know more than what God knows. And I'm personally really uncomfortable with that last bit. Because the ultimate God that we're making, we know more than what he knows, that makes me very uh, the most uncomfortable. Because I know how dumb I am. <laughs> and that's why I'm uncomfortable with that. I can't overrate my own intellect. I've got street smarts, I've got a little bit of logic, but there's no way I'm anywhere near the wisdom of God. And so if my views are above his views, I'm running into some fair bit of trouble there.
And I want to say, even though I'm painting the picture of this false god, what he must look like if he was indeed there. It's easy, uh, sorry, it, it's important that we have courageous, open discussions in community to figure out who the real God is. Because remember, there needs to be compassion in the room that some people in this room struggle believing this false god. And that's why we talk about this stuff to say, well, really, if you're going to believe that, here's some extra stuff to consider. Let's go through this together. But realistically, online, out in our community, and even in this room, there are folk that are still struggling with this notion. Now, I've had a bit of humour. I've gone pretty hard at this. But I want you to understand that people that are struggling with this, it's very real. And the whole series is predicated on the fact that people are deconstructing God and deconstructing faith. And we need to be bothered by that. And we need to be compassionate about that so if right now you're listening to me and you're kind of getting frustrated and you're kind of getting worked up saying well yeah it's easy for you you've had an easy life what about da, 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 da? you know what fair enough good questions keep them coming stay in community stay asking the questions stay respectful as we said last week listen to the answers but if this is tough for you we want to say that's okay It's okay. That's why we're talking about it. If it was easy, we wouldn't even bother preaching about it. It is tough. It is hard for some of you, particularly if it's recency bias and you've had something horrible happen in recent times. We're there with you. And if you're not quite yet where I'm at and what I'm talking about, that's okay. I don't, I'm not aware that this is a friendship breaker. I'm aware that this is something we can discuss together. And that's what we need to do. Even if you look at um, science, if you're not into God, we've got doctors in the room and talk to them because I'm terrible at this stuff. But I understand that, uh, what is it, immunity? Immunization is what? A little bit of harm in order to protect from a lot of harm, right? So even in science, if you took God out of it, by the way, I don't think you can do those things, but if you took God out of science... Even just your doctor is saying, I'm going to give you a little bit of harm in order to protect you from a lot of harm. So it's something that we can understand even aside from church, just in, in nature and in science. This, this, this notion that I'm proposing to you today is a logical one. So we're here to build faith. We're not just here to mock or, or figure out where the trouble is. Let's look, talk about what the flip side looks like and what we can do with this. Firstly, I want to say... That as we courageously look at these, uh, these scenarios and these discussions, I want us to be people that grow in faith. You know, and there are some preachers that have done what I've just done in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is. But there's no room for growing. It's like, oh, he's just knocked down faith, just said, you know, we, the trouble's going to happen, there's going to be problems, blah, blah, blah. Can I just say that's where I've stopped? And we need to continue to believe that faith is a good thing. We need to believe that if God gives you a word and you've heard from him and it's confirmed prophetically from somebody else and all the stuff that over the years, for those who have been around long enough, you've been taught, believe for that. You know, if we've got people in the room who have cancer or some sort of, you know, thing that's mucking up your life quality and and possibly even taking you to eternity too early... What, are we going to just say, well, God's not a bodyguard God, go home and die and we'll see you up in heaven? I don't think we need to be that church, right? So we need to be balanced because God is balanced. But it just occurred to me as, I, as the team worked together at saying, what are we going to do for this? And I, I, what are we going to do for this series? And I got this topic at request. That we need to make sure that this is not negative and we build to the faith, we look at the goodness of God, we believe that he is a healer, that he is a provider, that he is a God of breakthrough, that he is a God that fills us with his Holy Spirit, that he is our counsellor, that he is personal, that he's right there in the struggle and he's right there on the mountain, that he is that God that knows us and loves us and wants the best for us and we can connect to him in faith, believing for the very, very best. And I don't mind if you say amen right now. Because that's the God that we serve, even though he is not always giving us perfect circumstances in life. But I thank that God, and I can tell you from experience, and I can tell you as a man that has had a pretty easy life, but any time it's gone wrong, God has been there in the struggle for me. And we've shared the testimony before, but it was through death 
that I have a marriage and an in-law family that's not even in-laws, we're just family. Because of, of a death, life came even out of the worst thing because that's the God that we serve and he was with those that were needing to be comforted at their most time of mourning. So even as a family, we understand this God through personal experience. Unashamedly do we believe in him. Unashamedly do we lean in to listen to the word. Do we stand on the word and believe for his best? Do we get a word, not just from scripture, but from his Holy Spirit speaking to us personally, a message tailored for my shape? I want to hear that word and I want to grow on that. I want to believe for that and I want to see the breakthrough and I want that for you so much as well. Would you please turn to Psalm 34 verse 19 as we build faith in this God that's so much more than a bodyguard God. We see here, again in context, but let's look at this God and what he's like. Verse 19, a righteous man may have many troubles. There it is again, just like Jesus said, you will have troubles. But the Lord delivers him from them all. The Lord delivers him from them all. Sometimes that will be immediately. Other times it will be ultimately realized in passing away and going to heaven. And anything in between. But I want to tell you, God is a deliverer from all our troubles. All our troubles. Recency bias is a, such a wretched thing. It's so hard when we're going through something right now. But stand on the truth of that word in the context of the rest of Scripture. God is there and He's going to deliver us from all our troubles. Next one is 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. As we build faith in this much more complete God, as we look at who He is, not just a bodyguard God, but a God so much more than that, so much more wise than that. And even more powerful than we imagined him to be. And we look here, it says in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Anyone go to the gym? Some in this room, yeah, good. The basic premise is that power is built through weakness. Have you ever walked out of the gym? <laughs> You've been, had a big, big workout and you just feel like somebody could push you over with a feather. But it builds strength. And you see, God's interesting because our weakness is a chance for him to show his strength. I'll give you a personal example for me and every preacher in this room, of, of which there are several. We get up here and imagine if you had to do what we do and you get up and there's 120 people and they're all looking saying what are you going to preach about today and I'm like oh I've got to do this again yeah and you're on next week don't forget that as well oh but then you realize that I've had a terrible week my wife's been arguing with me all week because she's right and that helped makes it difficult and then the kids have been all naughty and uh, you know we just had a big bill come through and the car's broken down someone's backed into our car the in-laws have taken off and you know boo, 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 boo. And then I need to get up and preach and I've been sick in bed all week with worry as well as a wretched flu and I've got to come up with something, right? Can you imagine that if you were doing my job? These things happen from time to time, let alone come up with a new topic and all that. Thank God there's a massive Bible and a, a huge Holy Spirit. But these things happen, right? Jeff will tell you this. Dad, anyone else in the room? You still got to get up. And my way of doing it is just to let you know I've had a hard week. That's the first bit. Don't pretend because we're family, right? So that's a good place to start. But the second thing is sometimes that sermon with hardly any preparation and with all of that background story can be one of the most powerful sermons you'll ever hear. Not because I'm skilled and gifted and this amazing orator. It's because God is a good God that works through weak vessels like me. Now imagine that principle and take it to your context of whatever you're doing. No matter how new a Christian you are, when you're weak and you think, oh, I've got nothing here, you're a perfect candidate for God's power. Amen. You can preach on that verse all day, but we won't. I'll move on to Romans 8, verse 35 to 39. And that's a loud ringtone, isn't it? If you've got a hearing problem, you'll be able to hear that easily. Because usually I can't hear anything, but I heard that. So that's a good one. Make sure you keep that so you don't miss a call. 
verse 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Here we go, getting into the nitty-gritty, building faith of a real-life situation, not bodyguard God. This is rubber hits the road in Shepparton, in India, in Africa, in Asia, the Middle East. This is how it rolls for all of us in the human race. And it says here, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine... I hope I don't have the next one. Nakedness. That's what happens when you can't even afford clothes. It's an issue around the world. Nakedness. For others, sex slavery. I've got a number of people around the world that would suffer from this for various reasons. Nakedness, danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Well, there's the great scriptures to knock down the first part of the talk. Wow, we, New Testament. It's pretty depressing stuff so far. But then verse 37 sees the change of gear. And I want us to pick up on verse 37. I want us to see the change of gear here. And I want us to believe for what I'm about to read. And I want us to lean in and I want us to have faith built up as we read verse 37. No! No! doesn't say, no, we're not going to go through them. But no, it shan't separate us. In all these things, we are conquerors. I beg your pardon? Are you reading your Bible? Don't do that. You'll pick up my errors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, and I'm not even going to preach on this. I'm going to let Paul preach for himself. I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. It's a big creation, folks. In all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am not going to reduce God to a bodyguard God when he could be expanded to that God. A God who understands trouble, a God who understands pain, a God who understands the very worst of things can happen a million times over, but he will not separate himself from us. He'll be there right in the battle, seeing us through and delivering us eventually or immediately or anywhere in between from our trouble. That's the God that is alive and well and that is in this room by his Holy Spirit and that is available for personal relationship with you. Many of us already have relationship with that God. Some are looking into it. I thoroughly recommend that you get to know that God because when you dig into who he is, he's so much more than a smooth bodyguard. Thank you, Jesus, that you have allowed us to connect to this true mighty and loving compassionate god hallelujah so doubters you're here of course you're here that's why we've got the series firstly we love you secondly it's okay to doubt please don't do it for too long be in community talk about it ask questions find out things read the scriptures humble yourself and talk to god even if you're angry with him and i want to encourage you you'll get to know him and you'll get your breakthrough and god will see you through the trouble you are presently finding yourself in. For those that aren't doubting, for those that already believe everything I've said, for those that have life that is fulfilled and it's going well, can I remind you that when life is easy and when life is successful, we can let these things slide. The harder it is to stay close to God in comfortable times, isn't that right? So if you're doing comfortable Christianity at the moment, can I encourage you to take a few risks, make it awkward make it uncomfortable do something that makes your faith difficult in order to keep it growing don't wait for things to get worse it's better to grow faith now before it gets worse as i said we need to have compassion in the room some christians or those raised in the faith some ex-christians or those raised in the faith that have moved away from faith community 
Some of those ones have experienced horrible, horrible things. We've even seen in this room, for those that haven't left, you know, the 40s and over, and I'm sure a lot of under 40s could stand with them, at having horrible, horrible things happen to them. It's real, isn't it? It's real. It's life. And we live in, I believe, the best country in the world, and we still will stand up. So something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And I want to tell you, for those that are struggling and for those that are in doubt, have questions about God, thinking about deconstructing God, but thinking about not reconstructing, can I say, the message today is not bad luck, grow up, get over it, just have faith. And unfortunately for some sections of our beautiful church or across the planet, that's the messaging that we've sent to those that are fragile, to those that are struggling, to those that are suffering. Just have faith. Now, if you're suffering, they're hard words to digest. I think we'd be better to just zip our mouths and take a meal across to that person, leave a note of love and encouragement and leave, than say, just have faith. Even though it's probably true, it's a plaudit- platitude, it's empty words for those that are struggling. Just have faith, get over it. It's just bad luck. Grow up. You should know better. Now, when you've suffered, some of right there now, others can remember. Is that what you really wanted to hear? May we get alongside those in faith and show compassion. It's so important that we have compassion in the room for those that are doing it tough. And so I realise not everybody's doing it tough and you may be forgiven for thinking, well, this topic's not for me. I understand that others are struggling, but I'm not. Well, this topic is for you because if you're doing it well, you need to have compassion and be part of the answer for those that aren't doing well. We need to be a community that loves and gets around people who's gentle, also firm, because sometimes when you're having a hard time, you're being naughty and you need a little... Is my foot moving here? A um, little bit of a... What do they call it? Encouragement. Encouragement. <laughs> Encouragement. That can be needed at times. Matthew 9, 36, and this will pivot to my last point today. How good is this? I can't not preach this at least once a year. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. I want to tell you about a crowd that exists in Australia in the year 2023. It's a crowd of young people that have grown cynical with authority and the established church. By the way, they're not a crowd that is against Jesus. By the way, they're not a crowd that's against God. They're not even necessarily against religion. But they've grown disillusioned with the church and they've left the church. It's a crowd. It's not just one or two. It's a highway of young people that have grown to be a crowd. And I'm bothered by that. And I reckon if Jesus was walking this planet rather than here through his Holy Spirit, he'd be bothered by it as well. And we see as he approaches the crowd, he has compassion on them. And why? Because they were harassed and they were helpless. My wife is a good repeat educator. She says, what's the faith of the next generation worth to you? We had 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s. That's 50 years of experience, individually, let alone collectively. What's the faith of the next generation worth to you who are in that category? Because I'm telling you what I have noticed and what data is telling us Our young people are harassed, and you can even see it sometimes on young people's faces. By the way, great generation, so much potential, so much good stuff happening in our youth. It's not a put down of youth, but understand, there is a crowd of people, not everybody, but there is a crowd of people who are harassed and they are helpless. And listen to this, like sheep, can you have mobs of sheep without a shepherd? Yeah, you can. Like sheep, they are without a shepherd. Not by themselves necessarily, but they're wandering around letting each other know where not to go. 
I'm bothered by this. I really, really am. Harassed and helpless generation who have left church in their droves because we failed them in sections of the church. What is the faith of the next generation worth to you and what are you going to do about it? And I'm asking myself the question, it's not just to you, of course. What is that worth? They're harassed, they're helpless, they're like sheep without a shepherd, wandering around with good intent but nowhere to go. Without a God because apparently creation's a myth. There has to be compassion in their room. If you've got it together, there has to be compassion for these, these guys because it's not easy for them. Oh, they've got wealth. We gave them the best country. They've got education. They've got money. They've got all those things. Yeah. And thank you to every generation that has helped build that for our young people. And I want our young people to be appreciative of that. You've walked into a world that's set up for you to succeed. And we thank every older person, especially those that went to war, for what they did to give us this amazing country. So, yeah, we need to grow up and be appreciative of that. This is not just calling all old people out. But can I mention where they are poor? In spirit. And again, that has to bother us. The poverty of spirit of youth. Yes, they've got all the opportunity, but please show some compassion for the poverty that's in the room. And can we enrich them with our love and our compassion and our care and our discipleship and our mentoring so they can see the real God, not the one they've deconstructed? And at the end of the day, and I have to obviously answer on this, uh, sorry, finish on this, Jesus is the answer to this deconstruction conundrum. Jesus is the answer. He always has been. He always will be. A man who was familiar with suffering. A man who was despised. A man who was rejected. A man who went to the cross. And for every person that is going through a hard time, there's somebody that understands better than anybody in history, and that's Jesus. But he's more than just an understanding God. He's a breakthrough God who died on the cross so that every one of our rebellious sins, because many of us from all ages are in that rebellious sin, separated from God, deconstructed him and left, him, left with nothing. Jesus is the one that broke through and has given us an opportunity to reconstruct and have a hope and have a future and be delivered from our troubles and ultimately have forever with him in heaven. That's the Jesus. And my wife said something. The best man helped me because I wrote it down and then I left it off my notes. Christianity started by the worst thing happening to the best man. Thank you. And I had it in my notes. And why did it drop out? I don't know. Thankfully, you're in the front row. Christianity started... By the worst thing happening to the best man. That, my friends, is the answer to the bodyguard God myth. May you be encouraged if you're doubting. May you be inspired if you're deconstructing to reconstruct. Two more weeks of encouragement to come from here at GVCF Church. If you're already across this and you believe it and you're doing well, thank you so much. Have compassion in the room to help somebody up out of the miry clay that they're in. And let's do this thing together. Courageous conversations, believing for breakthroughs, having room for disagreements and doubt, but gee whiz, let's get alongside them and see them get all the way. And by the way, not just people who have left the church, people who have never known the church. This is their chance to find the real God, not the one that the mythical culture is telling us about. Lord, we thank you today that you are a good God. We thank you today that your scriptures are so full of promises and that as we've just heard, the worst thing has happened to the best man to save us from ourselves. We give you glory today, Lord. And I, I know this church so well. I know where we're at today. It's like, yeah, I'm getting this. Just, just give me a chance to absorb it. I can hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. It's pretty heavy, but it's pretty encouraging. Just let me absorb it. And so, Lord, I pray, even as we just pause at the end of this day, Lord, that we would absorb your messaging that has come from the Holy Spirit. Anything that I've said that is intended from you to go to us and be received, we release that right now. Anything that has been of man, we leave for another time. 
Father, speak to us today, please. Speak to us today that there would be compassion in the room for each and every one of us, including those that are going through a hard time, that they could be compassionate not only to themselves but to others. Father, help us to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be a helpmate for somebody who isn't. Help us, Lord, we pray. And just as we're praying here, is there anybody that is really struggling with a bodyguard God type mentality, just thinking, why is God allowing this to happen to me? And you might, you've been encouraged today. Yep, thank you. Anyone else that just needs prayer? You've heard what I've had to say, but it's almost like you need God to, to help the penny to drop. So it's not just academic, but it's something that God is putting in you to change you. Is there anyone else that wants prayer for that? Because I want to pray for that today. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Just wants to get it, not just know it, but get it deep, deep down. Please just wave to me and I want you to pray as a congregation with me because this is really tough for some people, the kilometres they're doing on this stuff is not easy. Anybody else just struggling with a bodyguard God kind of mentality and need God to show himself so much more real than just that God? Thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Lord, we pray for those that have responded. And even if it's just one or two, Lord, it's important for us. And we don't know who online is responding to this as well. It's important to us to really pray for them. Lord, we've presented the scriptures, we've built faith, but ultimately it's you who confirms your word. And so we're praying, God, that you would send your Holy Spirit on a specific mission to fill these ones with your Holy Spirit and to fill them with an understanding of who you are. As they've heard further theology on who you are and what you're like, Lord, may that penny drop. Beyond academia, beyond suspicion, it would be absolutely known in their heart of hearts. We release that growth of faith and that breakthrough and even that healing for those that have gone through suffering, that they would be uh, delivered from their troubles the God way, the Jesus way. Father, we pray for them today with passion in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, 12 o'clock can only mean one thing, refreshments, cups of coffee. Uh, Hopefully there's some chocolate out there somewhere for people like me. But please, don't leave. Hang around. Enjoy someone's company. We've got a bunch of new people here, so I really hope if they're able to stay, they can meet one or two before they go. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you at Midweek Activities. See you then.